must be born again. That's a new beginning, and it's a new beginning that everyone needs. In whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sin. Giving my chains to God, and you know what God does? He sits there and answers my needs by giving me comfort. Good. And He said, I'm going to dedicate my life to you, God. I'm going to preach your word. I'm going to preach. We your- have to allow the right voices to speak into our lives. Of the Lord today, He wants to do something for you. If you will just worship with us. Join us as we pray and as we praise. God is wanting to do a work in your life. He's able to do it, you know, because he has overcome the grave. He has victory today. He wears the victor's crown. Hallelujah. Do you believe that God can meet your every need? Let's just worship him today and let's give him some glory. Hallelujah. Now the darkness fades into new beginnings As we lift our eyes to a hope beyond All creation waits with an expectation To declare the reign of the Lord our God We will not be moved when the earth gives way for the risen one is overcome oh, yes. and for every fear there's an empty grave for the risen one is overcome now the silence breaks in the name of jesus as the heavens cry let the earth of triumph to declare the reign of the Lord our God. We will not be moved when the earth gives way, for the risen one is overcome. And for every fear, there's an empty grave.
moved when the earth gives way, for the risen one is overcome. And for every fear, and for every fear, oh, there's an empty, there's an empty grave. grave. For the risen one is overcome. We will not be moved when the earth gives way. For the risen one is overcome. And for every fear, there's an empty grave. For the risen one is overcome. visiting with us today. I'm um, so glad to have you with us here today. Go ahead. So glad to have the McCarthy family from Casa Grande. So glad to have you with us here today. And we have, they, you guys just kept piling in and piling in. And so we're glad to have you with us, but it's an honor to have uh, Brother Bernard, our general superintendent with us here. So, so glad to have you here with us again this morning. You're you're going to be blessed today, no doubt about that. Uh, but we want to encourage everybody here just to 
if you came here today, like I said, you did not walk in here on accident today. If you came here looking for answers, if you came here looking for an answer to prayer, then you walked into the right place today. And we believe in corporate prayer, so we have a couple of prayer needs that we'd like to bring to the congregation. We want to uh, bring Abby Gushwa to prayer today. She's 10 weeks pregnant, but she's having complications with her pregnancy. And we want to pray for healing in her life. And we want to continue to pray for Sister Lynch, uh, Shelly Walter's mom, that God would continue to put her, his hand on her life. And if you have a need, it, you may not have brought it to our attention, but you know what? God will hear that need. And if you have a financial need, a healing need, whatever that need be, lift that hand up in the air. And somebody's going to see that and we're going to be praying for you. But we can lift everybody up in prayer. And let's pray over the rest of this service today. Lord, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for this opportunity to come to you in prayer. But, God, we pray for these needs, God. I pray for Abby in a mighty way. Your word says by your stripes we shall be healed, God. And I pray by the power and the authority of your word and your name that you would heal her, God, that you would keep her and her baby safe right now. And wherever she is, God, that she would hear the prayers of this church today, God. I pray for a complete healing upon her body. I pray for Sister Lynch, God, that you would heal her, God, that you would be with her. Let her know that her family's praying for her. Her church family is praying for her today. But, God, I pray for healing upon her body. And, God, I pray over the rest of this service today. I pray somebody somebody new would get filled with the Holy Ghost, God. I pray somebody new would get baptized in Jesus' name. I pray somebody would get a revelation from you about how great and how amazing you are. Why don't you clap your hands, thank you for what he's doing, thank you for what he's going to do. We love you and we worship you, and in Jesus' mighty name, amen. <laughs> your goodness I would be desperate without your love safe to the darkness if it wasn't for the cross you
Amen. We want to continue in this atmosphere of worship. We believe giving of our tithes and our offering is just another form of worship. But we're glorifying God with something we hold dear and what God has blessed us with. So as our ushers come, we want to be a blessing to this weekend and to our special speaker and continue in worship. Thank you, Jesus, for a wonderful presence here today, God. We thank you, Lord, for changing lives. God, I pray that you will bless this offering to benefit your kingdom for your work, God. You, you are great, greatly to be praised, and we give to your greatness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The glory is yours, Lord. You deserve it. Blessing, honor, strength, and power. Yours alone now and forever. A love this world could never stop. There is no one like our God. Reaching down to touch the broken. Oh, mercy. Mercy breaking through this moment. Faithful. Faithful is the one who saves. Worthy is your name. Oh God, the glory is yours. The kingdom is come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise and the glory is yours. The glory is yours. Yes. Thrones and angels watch and wonder. On that day. On that day when time is over. Oh, every heart, every heart at last proclaim, worthy is your name. Oh, God, the glory is yours. The kingdom is come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise and the glory is yours. The glory is yours. Oh, God, the glory is yours. Kingdom is come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise and the glory is yours. The glory is yours. Oh, 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 oh. Nobody beside you. There has never been anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you, there has never been anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you, there has never been anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you, there has never been anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you, there will never be anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you, there will never be anyone. Anything like you, nobody beside you, there will never be anyone, anything like you, nobody beside you, there will never be anyone, anything like you. Oh God, the glory is yours, the kingdom is come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise and the glory is yours. The glory is yours, oh God, the glory is yours. The kingdom is come and the battle is over. Jesus, in your name we rise and the glory is yours. The glory is yours, nobody beside you. There will never be anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you, there will never be anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you, there will never be anyone, anything like you. Nobody beside you, there will never be anyone, anything like you. Let's give a shout of praise to the Lord on high. Hallelujah. 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 The glory is yours, Lord. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. What a wonderful time of worship we have enjoyed here together. And I tell you what, it's just uh, it's good to give the glory to God. Amen. Sometimes anniversary services, we, of course, want to honor our legacy, and we've talked about those that have served before. And But ultimately, the glory belongs to the Lord. This is the Lord's work. If the Lord doesn't build it, we labor in vain. But thank God for His abiding presence. And I just want to join my welcome along with uh, the other pastors that have spoken today and just welcome all of our guests. It's great to see the Abrams from the Abrahams from Florida. Great to have you guys. God bless you. Amen. Good to see Bob and Vicki again. Great to see you again. Thanks for coming. Praise God. And others that were mentioned, and uh, if you've come in uh, after the welcome, I just want to say welcome. So glad that you're here. And we see a couple of people here that's been in the hospital, and they're on the road to recovery. So we're just thanking God for that. Amen. Thank God for his healing touch. Thank God for his presence today. Amen. I want to say also to our, our ministry team and our leadership team, thank you so much for this weekend. Everybody's pitched in and help make sure everything was nice for our guests last night and also tonight. Uh, thank you, Jessica, for uh, coordinating that wonderful minister's dinner last night. Appreciate that so much. Everybody enjoyed it. seemed like our ministers were uh, favorably impressed. Not that we were trying to impress them, but we were trying to impress them. But uh, it seemed like they enjoyed it, and we had a good time of fellowship afterward. Anytime we go away full in the spirit and full in the flesh, we're, uh, we're, uh, we have a good day. It's a good time. Amen. And we're especially delighted to have uh, Brother Bernard with us. We've looked forward to this for several months and uh, appreciate him uh, scheduling us in. He's very busy. He travels around the world, just meetings and seminars and preaching and conferences and dedications and anniversary services. So we appreciate him uh, coming, being with us. We have uh, respected him. I have respected him for years. Most of my ministry, I've been aware of his name and his writings. And uh, uh, I just want to say something to our young ministers. It's never too young to get started. How old were you when In Search of Wholeness was printed, uh, published. He was 23 when he co-wrote In Search of Holiness with his mom, and he's been writing ever since. Now there's a whole bookshelf full of Bernard books. So guys, what are you waiting on? <laughs> if Brother Bernard can do it, you can do it. Huh? <laughs> Amen. Well, I, I appreciate his uh, legacy of faithfulness, and uh, he has had profound impact on the church worldwide, and, and especially the oneness movement, and we appreciate what he is continuing to do in that regard, his leadership in so many areas. And so it's, it's really an honor to, to be able to have him here and to introduce him to you once again. Are you ready to receive something from the word of the Lord? I can guarantee you, you're going to be blessed today. Come ahead, Brother Bernard. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Praise the Lord. Would you like to stand as I go to the word of the Lord? Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9. It's certainly a privilege to be here in Gilbert, Phoenix area with Brother and Sister Boffman. We appreciate their ministry of many years. And I gave a little report on the UPCI last night. But let me just reiterate that it's churches just like your church all across our fellowship who make us what we are. So thank you for your participation. You could perhaps just operate independently or with some small group and meet your own needs, but that's not the point. The point is the whole gospel to the whole world by the whole church. The point is the 42,000 churches in 194 nations and 35 territories, 5 million constituents. 
the point is we want to reach not only Phoenix and Arizona, but the entire world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So while you're standing, I'm going to read from Deuteronomy chapter 7. Just before Israel was to enter the promised land, God gave them this message through Moses. In Deuteronomy 7, 9, it says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. I want to preach to you today for a little while on the faithful God. The faithful God. And you may be seated. The faithful God. In the context, Israel was getting ready to enter into the land of Canaan. And God knew that they would face the temptation to worship many different gods. Because the culture of that day said that each nation had its own God. Each mountain, each river, each valley. And if you were going to enter a, a nation or land and you were going to prosper, you wanted your flocks and herds to multiply, you wanted your crops to grow, you, need to worship, you needed to worship the gods and goddesses of fertility, the gods and goddesses of that land. And so to prevent his people from backsliding and worshiping idols and false gods, in the preceding chapter we find the classic statement of Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And we still believe that today. We still believe there's only one true and living God. And He's the only one we should worship, the only one we should serve. Well, in that context, now the next chapter, Deuteronomy 7, 9, it says, in essence, one of the ways you can know the true God in contrast to all the false gods the true God is the faithful God. So according to this world, there may be many lords and many gods, as Paul stated. But to us, we know that these other gods are false. But how do we know who's the true God and who's the false God? One way we know the true God and only the true God is the faithful God. The faithful God. What does it mean to be faithful? To be faithful means loyal, steadfast, trustworthy, someone you can safely put your faith in and you will not be disappointed. Someone who keeps his word. The opposite of faithful is unfaithful. The book of Proverbs talks about an unfaithful person. It says that person is like a broken tooth or a foot out of joint. Think about that. If you're sitting in the chair and you've got a sprained ankle or or your foot's broken, uh, it may not really bother you at that moment, but when you stand up and try to put your weight on it, it fails. It hurts. Uh, the broken tooth may not really be an issue until you bite down on the apple. If you didn't have a problem before, you now have a problem. In other words, unfaithful means when you don't need it, it's probably okay. It's just when you need it the most. It's just when you rely upon it, it will fail. So, there are a lot of people who will be your friend, but they're not necessarily a faithful friend. In other words, when you're the one paying for lunch, they'll be there. When you're the one throwing the party, they'll show up. They'll be your friend. But when you are the one in desperate need, they're nowhere to be found because they're not a faithful friend. They are unfaithful. The true God is faithful in every circumstance, no matter what. You can count on Him. Even when you don't understand, even when you don't have an emotional feeling, you can trust God and you can stand on the Word of God because He is the faithful God. Now, you might say, Brother Bernard, uh, we don't have a lot of people around here worshiping Baal and Chemosh and all these gods of ancient Canaan, so I don't know what you're talking about. Well, well, don't kid yourself. The people of Arizona have their gods. Because whatever would prevent you from serving the true God, that in essence has become your God. So there are a lot of people say, well, you know, we can't really come to church very much because we've got too many other things going. We're pursuing pleasure. Well, pleasure has become their God. 
There are some people who say, well, I'm not going to get baptized in Jesus' name because that contradicts my tradition, my ancestors. Well, then your tradition has become your God. Well, I can't, I'm not going to really seek God and, and be filled with the Spirit and walk in the Spirit and pursue holiness because I've got a lot of other things I want to do. And, uh, you know, I, I have other priorities. I'm, I, I'm trying to rise in society. I'm trying to make money. I'm, I'm trying to get ahead, and I can't make those commitments. Well, then money, material things, social position, that has become your God. And so the people of this world have their gods of various kinds. And when everything is going well, it may seem that their gods are blessing them. Or in other words, their philosophy, their tradition, their way of life is working out just fine. They're pursuing their hobbies and their pleasures. They don't have time for church. They're involved in their sins, and, and they're enjoying it because the Bible does say there's pleasure in sin for a season. And so when everything's going right, they got a good job, their health is good, their family is okay, well, it seems like, well, my philosophy of life is working. You know, if, if a problem comes up, I've got health insurance, I've got life insurance, I've got money in the bank, uh, well, I can take care of whatever is wrong, I'm good. I've got a retirement plan. Everything is taken care of. It may seem that their gods, their philosophy, their tradition, their pursuit of pleasure, their, their money, their material possessions, it may seem all those, those things are working just fine, giving them a happy life. But the test of a God is not when everything is going right. The test of a God or a philosophy or a way of life is when things go wrong. Because what you're going to find, all the gods of this world are unfaithful. When you don't really need them, they're there for you. But when you really need them the most, they will fail. They cannot deliver. What happens when the economy crashes? What happens when you lose your job? What happens when the stock market goes down and half of your retirement plan is wiped out? What happens when there's a terrible car accident? What happens when... There's a devastating phone call. What happens when you're looking the doctor in the eye and the doctor says we really don't have anything else we can do? What happens when your marriage is falling apart? What happens when one of your kids is on drugs or put in jail? What happens with all, during all the trials of this life? Most of all, what happens when you face the moment of death itself? What you're going to find out is all of the gods of this world are unfaithful. All the money in the bank cannot buy peace of mind, cannot buy a happy home, cannot solve the greatest needs and problems and issues of life. All the pursuit of pleasure cannot substitute for satisfaction in your soul. I'm here to tell you that all of the gods of this world are un. Faithful. There's only one God who is faithful in the good times and the bad times. There's only one God who's faithful when you've got lots of money and when you don't have money. There's only one God who's faithful when you're in good health or when you're sick. There's only one God who is faithful when your family's going through a crisis or when your church is struggling. I'm here to tell you there's only one God who is faithful during all the circumstances of life. There's only one God who can bring you from this life into eternal life. He's known in the Old Testament as Jehovah, but he has been revealed in the New Testament as the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the book of Hebrews says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. I'm saying he is the faithful God. We ought to worship him right now and give him praise. He's the faithful God. The faithful God. The faithful God. Let me share a few ways in which our God is faithful. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, we find a classic statement of Scripture. Hebrews 11 and 6, it says simply this, Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. The first part of the verse you must believe that God is. So you must put your faith in God. The only way we can please God is through faith. 
That's the only way we can be saved. That's the only way we receive God's blessings. It's not by our good works. It's not because we're better than anybody else. We work harder. Uh, we live a better life. Those things won't save you. The only thing that will save you is your relationship of faith in Jesus Christ. And it's important to understand the reason why we're blessed in our daily life is because we walk by faith. We don't live a holy life in order to get saved. We live a holy life because we are saved. We could not live so holy that we deserve to be saved. We live a holy life because God is working on the inside, changing us from the inside out. It changes the way we think, the way we talk, the way we dress, the way we act. It changes our relationships. But it's not our improving ourselves. It's our trusting in God. And God is the one who's working in our lives. So our entire relationship from start to finish is by faith. But notice that the last part of the verse tells us that God is someone you can safely put your faith in. In other words, he will be faithful to you. If you trust in God, you will not be disappointed. It doesn't matter who you are, according to this verse. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We must understand this about God. No matter who you are, no matter where you've come from, no matter what your race, the color of your skin, the language you speak, your family background, the country you come from, no matter what kind of sins you've committed or what kind of lifestyle you've been living, if you will come to God in faith and repentance. Now, if you're trying to hold on to sin and seek God at the same time, that doesn't work. But if you come seeking after God, if you come wanting God, if you come with a repentant heart, you have the absolute guarantee that none of those things I mentioned can change the fact God will hear your cry. God will respond to you. God will forgive your sins. God will fill you with His Spirit. God will save your soul. You can count on it. You can guarantee it. Why? Because He's the faithful God. I'm preaching God is faithful to save. If you want to be saved, you can be saved. If you want to have your sins washed away today, you can have your sins washed away today. If you want to be filled with God's Spirit today, you can be filled with God's Spirit today. How can I be so sure? How can I guarantee it? Because He's the faithful God. God is faithful to save. I, I mentioned... Uh, last night, I think that my wife and I started a church in Austin, Texas. Back in 1992, we started our home, and uh, over the years it grew. Now there's a beautiful building there in Austin under Pastor Shaw, right there on the freeway. It seats about 1,000, and it has room to expand to 2,000, so they, they keep finishing out the building as they grow and uh, uh, under roof. But it's got about, I think it's 12 acres there. And I think probably, I think it's about 100,000 cars pass twice each day. So it's a major operation. But I remember in the early years, in fact, when we built our first building, Brother Boffman, we built a building, uh, 9,600 square feet, seat about 300. So that's kind of, we were in a rented building for four years. So I understand a little about the tearing up and putting down and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I won't tell you all the details, but you can relate. And uh, anyway, when we we're trying to build our first building, I had to serve as the general contractor because that's the only way we could afford it. Although I didn't know anything about construction, I had to learn. And I tried to walk the plans through the city and all that kind of stuff. I have many stories to tell you. But anyway, we desperately needed some very qualified subcontractors who would do a, a good job at a reasonable price. So we found a concrete man that was highly recommended, gave us a very reasonable bid. Uh, his name was Tony. He had been a rock and roll concert promoter, traveled the world. He finally settled down, got married, and started a business. And as a young man, he was from New York City. Now, don't get offended if you're from New York City, but he was the, one of those stereotypical New Yorkers. No nonsense, to the point, brash. He didn't care. 
Now, he's from an Italian family. He's in the concrete business. He told me, you don't want to meet some of my relatives back in New York City. <laughs> so anyway, um, but so we, we hired him for the job. And, uh, of course, our men started talking with him about the Lord, naturally. Well, he didn't need God. He was an agnostic or an atheist. He told me later, one time he got mad at God, he shook his fist in the sky and said, God, if you're real, just kill me right now. Well, God didn't kill him, so he figured there was no God. He didn't care about God. He had everything life could offer as a, a young man, married, beautiful home, cars, motorcycle, boat, airplane. He had it all. So he wasn't even interested in talking about God. He did a good job, and that was it. Four years later, we're building phase two, a new sanctuary to seat 600. And uh, so we need a concrete guy. We tried to find Tony, but we had a really hard time finding him. We, we finally found him. His business had crashed and gone bankrupt. He had lost everything. He and his wife were getting a divorce. Uh, he was hooked on alcohol and drugs. Um, he was battling insomnia. His, his mind was messed up. He couldn't sleep at night. He was taking pills and sleeping about one or two hours. And so he was mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually exhausted. He needed a job, so we hired him as a foreman, and we started working with him. And, of course, our men began to talk to him about the Lord. And this time, he was a little more willing to listen. They said, Tony, if you want to be delivered from alcohol and drugs, you need God. If you want to get your, your marriage back, you need God. If you want to sleep at night, you need God. If you want your business restored, you need God. And so he began listening. You see, Tony didn't really believe in God, but God believed in Tony. God's not looking for ways to send people to hell. God's looking for ways to reveal truth to people. He's looking for ways to save people. He's the faithful God even when we're not faithful. Even if you're not sure if there is a God. It's the, the scripture says you must believe that he, he is. What if you don't even know? If you'll say, God, I don't really know, but if you're there, I want to know. God will take that. If you'll say, I don't know what these people are receiving, but if it's real, I want it. God will take that. He'll start with whatever level you're willing to start with. If you'll just start with the minimum opening of faith, then God will respond, and then your faith will grow because God is faithful to save. And so I was working in my office, and uh, they were on the job site next door. They came over and said, Pastor, we're taking a break from work. Tony's over there repenting of his sins. He wants to get baptized in Jesus' name. I said, let's do it right now. So we took the break and baptized him in Jesus' name. Well, we had a men's conference coming up. I hear the Arizona District is starting one next year. So we always brought a lot of men, like 50 or 60 men, to men's conference. For some reason, we could bring 100 women to women's conference, but only about 60 men. Just men are harder to pry loose of things. Um, but anyway, what they said is, look, everyone who goes to men's conference receives the Holy Ghost. So you have to go. He went. Well, every service he came up for prayer, but he didn't receive the Holy Ghost. Saturday noon at the end of the last service, he still hadn't received the Holy Ghost. They're going back to the hotel room to check out. He said, you know, he's from New York. He said, I thought you told me I'd received the Holy Ghost. What's going on? They said, look, we haven't checked out yet. We're going back to the room, but we're going to have a prayer meeting, and we're going to stay in that hotel room until you receive the Holy Ghost. So that's when Tony received the Holy Ghost. I'm here to tell you, God is faithful to save. His wife came into the church. She was Jehovah's Witness. She had, I think, something like four or five stepfathers, a really troubled past, but she came. She got in the church. What I'm here to tell you is I don't care who you are. Or I don't care who your coworker, your friend, your neighbor, your family member might be. Don't 
write them off. Don't prejudge the harvest. We've got a God who can save anyone, and he wants to save anyone. It doesn't matter. That's why the church has to be open to every race, to people of every lifestyle. You say, what if somebody comes that has a lifestyle contrary to God's word? We don't hate them. We don't despise them. We say, you're welcome. Come right on in. We've got a message that will work for everybody because God is faithful to save. Amen. Let me hasten on. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. There's another verse of Scripture about the faithfulness of God. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I'm going to make a shocking statement. And if you're a visitor, I'm, I'm kind of sorry you have to hear this. But... If it really messes you up, I'll be flying out this afternoon, but Pastor Bobman will be here, and he'll be happy to make an appointment to visit with you, to explain everything, to pray with you, straighten it all out. So, but I want you to notice something. It says, if we confess our sins. Now, this is a letter written to the church, not to unbelievers. And it says, if we confess our sins. Here's the shocking statement. I know this is going to be disillusioning and disappointing, but I'm really sorry to have to tell you this. Sometimes Christians sin. They're not supposed to. If you keep reading the same book, in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, I write these things that you sin not. We're supposed to live a holy life. Every day we get up and we commit that day to God. And we, we say, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. And when temptation comes, we resist it and we live for God that day. We can do that. You could do that for one day in the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you just do that every day, you'll be living a holy life before you know it. Unfortunately, sometimes we fail. Now, since I received the Holy Ghost at age 7... I've never robbed a bank. I've never murdered anybody. But can I say I've never sinned? When you think and understand that sin can be your attitude, your spirit, your thought life, your words, we've all failed God. And when that happens, the devil would like to beat us up and say, you're a sinner. You're a hypocrite. Just stop coming to church. Church is too strict anyway. If you keep coming, he'll say, well, you can never be a praise singer. You can never be a soul winner. You can never be a prayer warrior because you're a hypocrite. You're a sinner. You're a failure. Well, well, if we're living in sin, we ought to feel guilty because that guilt motivates us to repent. But when we recognize we've done wrong, you don't have to wait till next Sunday. At that moment, you can say, God, forgive me of that bad spirit. Forgive me of what I said or what I did. I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be that kind of person. I want to live for you. I want, and, and at the moment you do that, God will forgive you. And you restart the day walking in holiness. So don't listen to the devil. Don't listen. Even if you, as I said, if you have guilt, well, that, that guilt tells you to repent. Repent. Once you repent it, once you've given it to God, don't listen to your thoughts and feelings. Don't listen to what other people say. Don't listen to what the devil says. Listen to what God says. God's word says he is faithful to forgive you. That means he'll do it every time. He's not arbitrary. He's not biased. You don't have to get on his good side. You don't have to twist his arm. You don't have to be one of his special favorites to get an exception. No, he'll treat everyone the same. If you want forgiveness, God is not only faithful to save you in the beginning, but God is faithful to restore. So whether it's the sin of a moment, or whether you've drifted for months, or whether you've walked out on God and gone back to a sinful lifestyle, whatever the case might be, if you'll come back to God, you'll find He's still there where you left Him. Because that's the kind of God He is. God is the faithful God. He's faithful to restore. I told you about Tony. I'm not telling you anything he hasn't testified about publicly. But, you know, you can be saved in one day. But it can take time to change habits. 
and to become a disciple and to learn about holiness. And so several of our men made a, an agreement with Tony that they would talk to him every single day. And they said, if you're battling a temptation, you call us. We'll pray with you over the phone. Or if you want us to, we'll come where you are anytime, day or night, to help you overcome your addictions. So for about one year, they made that kind of commitment with Tony. Sure enough, in that first year, Tony failed. He was so embarrassed and humiliated that he refused to come to church. His wife kept coming. He wouldn't come. I tried calling him. He wouldn't answer or return calls. I emailed him. No response. I typed a letter, stuck it in the mail. No response. Finally, I gave him an invitation for Easter Sunday. I thought surely he would be there. He didn't show up. So I checked with his wife, and I went over to his house that afternoon. I knocked on the door. I invited myself in, and I sat down, and I talked to him. I said, Tony, you failed, but God didn't fail. You messed up, but God didn't mess up. You fell down, but God didn't fall down. God did a miracle of deliverance, but you're in danger of letting that miracle slip between your fingers. But I want you to know God is still here. God will forgive. God will restore. The people of the church are not standing in judgment and condemnation. They're just waiting for you to show up, and they're going to tell you how glad they are to see you. They don't think evil of you. You've got to get back. I said, we're having a drama tonight. I need you to promise to come tonight. He thought, well, it's just a drama. What could it hurt? So he made the promise. Well, sure enough, as you can imagine, the Spirit of God moved. Tony found himself back at the front repenting, and he was restored and renewed in the Holy Ghost. That was in the year, I think it was 2000, so that's been probably 19 years ago. God has blessed Tony with more businesses than he had before. He's got more uh, wealth as well as helping uh, invest in the new church building, Urshan College, Urshan Graduate School, and still... Tony is blessed. Not only that, he's an ordained minister of the United Pentecostal Church. The faithful God. God is faithful to restore. One more verse of Scripture. I'm almost finished. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Well, here's my second controversial statement, which I know you're not going to want to hear, but Brother Boffman is a wonderful pastor, and I'm the general superintendent, so I go around making sure pastors stay busy. So I'm just trying to make sure. But here's the shocking statement. Sometimes Christians have trials. Now, I know we tell you, you need to serve the Lord. It's joy unspeakable, full of glory. It's the best life ever. It gets better and better. It's wonderful. It's exciting. All that's true. But we usually don't say, and you're going to have trials. But, you know, really having trials is being human. Isn't that right? Did you know unbelievers have trials? Did you know unbelievers lose loved ones, get in car wrecks, have divorces, etc.? It's not because you're a Christian, it's because you're a human. You live in a sinful world. You're, you haven't been glorified yet. God did not promise to block every trial, but he promised to screen every trial. So if you're going through a trial, that's proof that you can go through it by God's grace and you can get out of it by God's grace and there is a way out. You say, there is no way. Well, God makes a way where there is no way. I'm here to say, sometimes we go through trials and sometimes they may be a long time, but whatever time you have to go through that trial, God's grace will sustain you. And then at the right time, God will deliver you. What I'm saying is God is faithful to sustain and deliver. Just keep your trust in God. I could tell you story after story of your fellow believers around the world. I mentioned all those countries 
many of them are Muslim countries. Some of them are communist nations where we cannot operate legally, but we have to operate underground. We, we go in, and I've been, even as general superintendent, conducting leadership seminars. And, of course, I had to be discreet and careful. But we have some believers, the way they have church is in the privacy of their home with the doors and windows shut, watching services in their language streamed on the Internet. They have to pray to receive the Holy Ghost in their home. Then they contact us by email. We tell them, take your vacation, cross the border to a neighboring country where we operate legally. We have church in your language. We'll baptize you in Jesus' name and lay hands on you to receive the Holy Ghost and send you back home after your vacation. That's how some of our believers have church. Some of our believers in various circumstances, we've got missionaries that we don't even name as missionaries. We do not publicize them. We do not tell you who they are. I get reports from some of those missionaries. One of them in a country I shall not name, sometimes he has sent me a report saying something like this. Last month we started two new places of business and the boss is very pleased. Or my wife just got this email from one of the missionary wives that said, we went swimming with three people, had a wonderful time. Or this will test your Pentecostal knowledge. We took two people to Joel's house and had a great time. The new wine. What I'm trying to say is you have fellow brothers and sisters across the world in very adverse circumstances. I remember one time I checked with the leader about going to a country and I had to cancel the trip because there was a crackdown. So the next time we planned the trip, I contacted him and said, I want to know, and I had to go indirectly through several different routes, and I said, I want to know, is it safe? Because, you know, the worst case for me would probably get, I'm, I'm arrested, deported, put on a blacklist, you can never go back to that country. But if they get arrested in a meeting with me, They could be jailed, lose their job, fine. It could be devastating. And some of these people in this particular country, we have people in various professions with master's degrees, doctorates, high in government. They're all secretly Christians. And so I contacted the leader to say, do you think this time it's safe? And he responded back in a very humbling thing. He said, you're a man of God. God will tell you. And whatever God tells you, we'll do. Wow, you mean you're willing to take the risk just based on me? And I did go, and I don't have time to tell the whole story, but God did bless. When I saw those leaders, and here's a humble woman, maybe 30 years old, and she's the leader of 50 house churches in her city. And here's a young man who has his doctorate. Here's a young man who has a master's degree. Here's a a young woman, and, and they have a lot to lose but yet they're serving God joyfully, not with fear and trembling. But they ask me to lay hands on them to pray for them. For what? Not so much for protection, but for holy boldness and for wisdom to know who to talk to. They want to win souls, but if they talk to the wrong person, they could get arrested. So they have to know who to talk to. They have to hear from God. And they ask for miracles so that when they talk to an atheist or a Buddhist or uh, some other religionist about God, that when they pray for that person, they'll be healed or they'll be delivered. So, So the power will accompany the message to convince them to become Christians. So here they are, not praying primarily for personal safety, but praying for boldness to witness, wisdom, discernment, and the power of the Holy Ghost. Let's stand together. What I'm saying is, you've got fellow believers all across the world that go through trials. But God is faithful to sustain them during their trial. And God is faithful to deliver them out of their trial. If God will do that in other parts of the world, don't you think God will do that in Arizona? Don't you think God knows where you are? Whatever you're going through personally, in your family, on your job, at your school, in your church, whatever trials, don't you think God can bring you through those trials? Sure he can. He's promised. He didn't promise no pain. He didn't promise no suffering. He didn't promise no sacrifice. But he promised to deliver you. 
He said, I will sustain you during your trial, and I will deliver you out of your trial. He's the faithful God. He's faithful to save. He's faithful to restore. He's faithful to sustain and deliver. Let's call upon Him today. Would you close your eyes with me? And let's call upon the Lord. If there's someone here today that you need to commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, would you come to the front and kneel here or stand here? Repent of your sins. Ask God to forgive you. Surrender your life to God. Would you come right now? If you feel like asking someone to come pray with you, would you ask them to come pray with you? If there's someone you've never received the gift of the Holy Spirit, but you would like to be filled with the Holy Spirit, just like the Bible says, with the miracle of speaking in tongues, why don't you come right now? If there's somebody that needs restoration or renewal, would you come? The Lord has been reaching out for you. You need a new touch of God. Would you please come? If there's someone that needs an answer to prayer, why don't you come right now? Don't be shy or bashful. Don't wait till some other time. The faithful God is here right now. All across the church, let's find a place to pray. All across the church, let's find someone to pray with. Let's call upon the Lord. The faithful God is here right now. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. Oh, you have been so, so kind to me.
mountain you won't climb up coming after me no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me
God is speaking. God is touching. Let's respond just a little longer. Let the Holy Spirit minister in your heart. Receive what he has for you today. That's it. Reach out to him. Respond to his presence. Oh, I love you. Thank you for that everlasting love. Hallelujah. That overwhelming grace. shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Oh, there's no wall, no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, Oh, it chases me down 
work of restoration, wonderful work of the Spirit right now. Some of you have been battling some things. God came along with this message to remind you that He is faithful. There's no end to His love. How great is His love for us. Amen. He spoke some controversy, but it was all true. Amen. We have our issues. We have our problems. Yes, we have our sin. But He is faithful. He is faithful. We can confess our sins and find cleansing, refreshing, renewal. Let's thank God for the renewing of the Holy Ghost right now. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the touch of your Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in these lives, God. I pray, Lord, that you would sustain and strengthen each one, Lord. Draw us close to you, Lord. Help us to walk in you, Jesus, following after you. Thank you for that love that reaches. Thank you for that never-ending grace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Why don't you just reach out and let's share that love with somebody. Greet them. Tell them you love them. Greet our guests. Welcome them. So good to have you with us today. God bless you.